stars, according to the New York Times, Prince Harry is right, and it's not just a matter of royal gossip. This is an article by Zainab Tufekci, an opinion columnist. Any close follower of the British media should not have been surprised that after Prince Harry fell in love with Meghan Markle, the biracial American actress, years of vitriolic, even racist coverage followed, whipping hatred and spreading lies, including on issues far more consequential than a royal romance, is a specialty of Britain's atrocious but politically influential tabloids. People like me, uninterested in celebrities, shouldn't dismiss the brouhaha around Harry's memoir as mere celebrity tittle-tattle. He has made credible, even documented claims that his own family refused to stand up against their ugly, sustained attacks against Meghan. In other words, it appears that Britain's most revered institution, funded by tens of millions in taxpayer funds annually, plays ball with one of its most revolting institutions. At the very least, it seems clear by now where some senior members of the royal family position themselves in all this. Among those in attendance at a Christmas lunch in mid-December were Camilla, Britain's queen consort, Dame Judi Dench, Dame Maggie Smith, and some less luminous celebrities, including the acid-tongued columnist, Jeremy Clarkson, and the broadcaster and columnist, Piers Morgan, lately of YouTube. Both Clarkson and Morgan have been among the foremost participants in the multi-year media evisceration of Meghan, a daughter-in-law of Camilla and King Charles. Clarkson has prior ties to Camilla. His farm was featured in an edition of Country Life magazine that she guest edited. Just days after that Christmas lunch, he blasted Meghan when he wrote in his column in The Sun, quote, At night, I'm unable to sleep as I lie there, grinding my teeth and dreaming of the day when she is made to parade naked through the streets of every town in Britain while the crowds chant, Shame! and throw lumps of excrement at her. Unquote. The palace made no comment about that. Clarkson publicly apologized for the column after a fierce public outcry. Right, is this an episode of Game of Thrones? Not very original, but definitely very hateful. The palace made no comment about that. Clarkson publicly apologized for the column after a fierce public outcry. As for Morgan, he has called Camilla, quote, a class act. More than a decade ago, when many in Britain were still resistant to her becoming a queen consort because of her adulterous affair with Charles, Morgan wrote in his Daily Mail column, I can't actually think of a single other woman in the world better suited or more suitably experienced to be queen. Morgan quit his ITV morning show in a huff. In March 2021, after being roundly condemned for saying that he did not believe Meghan's claim to have been interested in unaliving herself during her first pregnancy, and that he wouldn't believe her if she read me a weather report, unquote. It wasn't his first such diatribe about her, and it wouldn't be his last. Classic cat's paw move. If the palace and Camilla and people who were anti Megan couldn't do or say things themselves, then just like Robert Greene and Machiavelli have told us, get somebody else to do it. That way you can be on the sidelines going, my word, I'm so shocked, when you're the person who put the words of poison into the mouths and into the heads of the people who perpetrated that BS in writing. But it wouldn't be, it wasn't his first such diatribe about her, and it wouldn't be his last. But he said Camilla soon demanded to know when I'd be back on telly. Clarkson and Morgan are just two players in a swamp of commentators and tabloids that are intimately tied to the royals they cover. Just before Queen Elizabeth II died, Charles hosted the editor of The Sun. Oh, it's a trashy rag. Oh, it's definitely National Enquirer level. Something the editor said was a regular 
occurrence. She wrote that he was always jovial and cheery with her. And Charles and Camilla recently hired the Daily Mail's longtime deputy editor as their communications secretary. What could Charles and Camilla think they are conveying by maintaining a camaraderie with a tabloid press that has behaved so noxiously to members of their own family with articles that have been so ugly and even racist? In 2016, days after Harry and Meghan's relationship went public, the Daily Mail called Meghan, who, as a child, lived in Los Angeles, almost straight out of Compton, an allusion to the 80s hip-hop album and later movie. The Mail described her family's picturesque Los Angeles neighborhood as gang scarred. For years, royals have had to fend off tabloid attacks, but the vitriol that has been applied to Meghan and the double standard to which she has been subjected is palpable. Once, after avocado toast was served at lunch, she hosted the Daily Mail ran a story with the headline, How Meghan's Favorite Avocado Snack, Beloved of All Millennials, is Fueling Human Rights Abuses, Drought, and Murder. The Daily Mail similarly proclaimed, Meghan Markle's beloved avocado linked to human rights abuse and drought. Millennial shame. The same tabloids ran approving stories associating Prince William and Princess Kate with avocados with no mention of human rights abuses. When Kate was seen holding her pregnancy bump, the Daily Mail said she did so tenderly. When Meghan did that, it was described as an act of vanity and Virtue signaling that implied the rest of us are barren harridans deserve to burn alive in our cause. Most, insi- most insidiously, Megan has been portrayed as a threat to other royal family members, even the children. The Daily Express claimed that Megan may have put Princess Charlotte's life at risk. How? By including at her wedding lilies of the valley, which shouldn't be ingested. However, they were also used at the weddings of Kate and Princess Eugenie without disapprobation. Queen Elizabeth II was portrayed as Meghan's victim. Especially after Harry and Meghan stepped down from their royal roles, the tabloids repeatedly claimed that Meghan had endangered the Queen's health. Harry has said that he pleaded with his family to publicly condemn this ugly campaign, but instead, Harry says in his book, Spare, the couple were ordered to remain silent, even against outright lies. Never complain, never explain, was the royal motto. But the royal family isn't always so complacent. When a plastic surgeon claimed on his Instagram account that Harry's sister-in-law, Kate, was receiving Botox, Kensington Palace officials issued an official condemnation and denial. They reportedly got at least one tabloid to take down a story claiming Kate was wearing hair extensions. William and Kate issued a strong statement and threatened to take legal action against the magazine Tatler after it called Kate perilously thin. Swaths of passages the palace had reportedly objected to were deleted from the story. Even less prominent members get explicit protection. Once the palace defended Charles's brother, Prince Edward's use of a private jet instead of an available train. Harry has claimed that while the royal family stayed silent about the media's abuse of his wife, behind the scenes it leaked, planted, or influenced stories with the worst elements of the royal rota. Representatives of news organizations that cover the palace in a preferential press pool in return for favorable coverage for themselves or distractions from their own brewing scandals. After telling only his immediate family about plans he and Meghan were making to travel or distance themselves from royal duties, Harry says in spare, those plans appeared in the tabloids attributed to unnamed sources. It's not just a matter of Harry's suspicions. The Daily Mail columnist Dan Wooten has said, Much of the negativity towards the couple is coming from within the royal family. The royal family and staff of the royal family are the ones that are very often leaking these stories to the press. 